from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Hell Screen by Ryunosuke Akutakawa Neither in the past nor in the time to come could one imagine a person comparable to the High Lord of Horikawa. I heard that before his birth, Daiotoku Mio, the king of magical science, appeared at his mother's bedside. From birth, Horikawa was different from the others. Of all the things he ever did, I cannot recall an act that did not deserve our wonderment. To mention an example among many, the structure of his palace, how should I define it? Immense, grandiose, was so astounding as to surpass the boundaries of our limited imagination. Some went so far as to compare his temperament and conduct to those of the first emperor of the Qin or the emperor Yan, although while considering his, this comparison, we should keep in mind the idea that different people have different opinions, as with the proverbial blind men who touch different parts of an elephant and drew contradicting conclusions about the animal. Contrary to those emperors, our Lord's intention was never to enjoy the luxury life can provide. He had a kind and generous heart that would partake in the happiness and distress of all, even the humblest amongst his subjects. For these reasons, when he encountered a procession of ghosts in the large palace of Nijo, he was able to pass through them unscathed. And when the spirit of Secretary Turu prowled every night the Karawanoin Palace in Higashi Sanyo, famed for the garden inspired by the marine landscape of Shiogama in the Michinuku province, the Lord reprimanded it, after which the specter vanished forever. Of course, as soon as the people of Kyoto, young and old, men and women, heard Horikawa's name, they would genuflect as if they had seen Buddha's avatar. One day, on his way home from the banquet of the plum blossoms, one of the oxen pulling his cart broke away and injured an old man who was passing by. It is rumored that the old man joined his hands to express his gratitude for having been touched by the hoof of the Lord's ox. His life was full of many memorable facts, most of which should be bequeathed to posterity. During a court banquet, the emperor gave him 30 horses, all of them white. Once, when construction work on the Nagara Bridge was damaged, he offered his favorite boy attendants as human pillars to propitiate the gods. He had a carbuncle removed from his thigh by a Chinese bonze, who had introduced the magical healing methods of a celebrated Chinese physician. If I should recount all the antidotes, I would never finish. But among all these episodes, none surpasses in horror the story of the hell scene painted on a screen that is not part of the Lord's family treasure. Even the High Lord, who was usually impassive, seemed to have been utterly shocked by the events. No need to explain that we, his attendants, were frightened out of our wits. In more than twenty years passed in the service of the Lord, I had never witnessed more horrid a spectacle, but before telling you the story, I must introduce the painter called Yoshide, the author of the hell scene on the screen. Yoshide, some people may even remember him today, and his time he was considered the first among painters, an unrivaled artist. When what I am going to relate happened, he was already over fifty. At first sight, he appeared to be a short, 
cantankerous old man, all skin and bone. Each time he came to the Lord's palace, he wore a clove-dyed hunting garment and a floppy eboshi on his head. But he had a vulgar appearance, and his lips, too red for his age, had an unsettling bestial quality. I do not know for sure the cause of this red color. Some said he had the habit of licking his paintbrush. Others, more slanderous, compared his appearance and gait to those of a monkey and nicknamed him Sahude, which meant monkey hide. About this moniker, this is a story I heard. Our monkey hide had an only daughter who was 15 years old and served as a lady-in-waiting in the Lord's palace. This girl, intelligent and observant beyond her age because she had lost her mother when she was little and had taken care of herself, was charming and very beautiful. For these reasons, she had won the good graces of her ladyship and all the waiting ladies. Someone from the province of Tamba, west of Kyoto, had offered a well-trained monkey to the Lord. The prince, the Lord's young son, who was at the time in the age of mischievousness, named the monkey Yoshide. The monkey's gestures were amusing indeed, and everyone in the palace laughed at the animal. If this mockery had been all, things would not have been that bad for the monkey. But each time it climbed up the pine tree in the garden, or soiled the mats in the prince's bedroom, Everyone chased him, shouting, Yoshide, Yoshide, to tease the poor beast. One day, Yoshide's daughter, Yukusuki, passed through the long corridor, carrying a letter attached to a winter plum branch, when she saw a small monkey come from beyond the sliding door and run toward her. The monkey limped and seemed incapable of climbing up one of the palace columns as she used to do. The prince ran after the monkey, a switch in his hand and cried, Stop, tangerine thief, stop! At this sight, the young woman stopped for an instant. Just then, the monkey flopped down at her feet, gripped the hem of her kimono, and begged her with doleful cries. She could not refrain from feeling compassion. Holding the plum branch with one hand, she picked the monkey up with the other, her long, muff-colored sleeve flying. Lord, she said in a smoothly agreeable voice, bowing, let me intercede in this monkey's favor. It is only a beast. Prithee, forgive it. But the prince had been chasing the monkey with determination. He made a face and stamped his foot three times. Why do you wish to protect it? This monkey is a tangerine thief, I tell you. It is a beast, she repeated. Then she took on a sad expression and dared say, When I hear the name Yoshire, I have the impression my father is being reprimanded. Hearing the remark, the prince, arrogant or not, gave in. I see. If you ask in the name of your father, I will pardon the monkey. Then he threw the switch down and went back to the sliding door whence he had come. From that day on, Yoshida's daughter and the monkey became fast friends. She tied a beautiful red ribbon around the animal's neck and also hung a tiny bell she had received from the young princess. The monkey would leave her presence on no account. Once Yuzuki had to stay in bed with a light cold, and the monkey watched over her, gnawing on its fingernails in apparent concern. Now things took a peculiar turn. No one would mistreat the monkey any longer. On the contrary, they all began petting it. Not only did the prince throw persimmons or chestnuts to the monkey, once his highness became furious because some samurai had shot a kick at the little beast. This news reaching his ears, the Lord gave gracious orders that girl and monkey be brought before his presence. He must also have known why the girl had come to protect the beast. You are a good and dutiful daughter, the Lord said. I am pleased with you. With these words she received a scarlet hakama from the Lord. The monkey mimicked the girl's deference by raising the hem of the robe to its forehead, to the Lord's immense amusement and pleasure. You can see that the Lord took the young woman into his good grace because he had been impressed with her filial piety, not because he admired her charms, as it was whispered. The rumors might have been justified on some grounds, but I will talk about such things later on. 
Suffice it to say that the Lord was not one to fall for as lowly a girl as a painter's daughter, no matter how charming. The girl withdrew from the Lord's presence, feeling highly honored. But being naturally wise and intelligent, she did nothing to await her fellow mate's jealousy. On the contrary, this honor won the lady's favor for both herself and her monkey. Her ladyship loved Yuzuki so much she kept the lady in waiting in her constant presence and brought her everywhere she went in her princely carriage. Now let me set the girl aside for a while as I tell you about her father, Yoshide. Although Yoshide, the monkey, came to be loved by everyone, Yoshide, the painter, continued to be hated by everyone. And they went on calling him Monkey Hide behind his back. The residents of the palace were not alone in this general dislike. The great priests of Yokawa, for example, would turn red in the face at the mere mention of Yoshida's name. As he had been a devil, as the rumor had it, Yoshida had painted the priest in a humoristic scene depicting his conduct, but I know of no foundation proving the rumor true. At any rate, Yoshida had a bad reputation everywhere. If one or two people did not speak ill of him, they were his fellow painters, who had seen his paintings but had never met him in person. Not only had Yoshida a vulgar aspect, he also had such shocking habits that everyone considered him a nuisance. For this reputation, he had no one but himself to blame. He was avaricious, mean, cowardly, lazy, and insatiable. But above all, he was insolent and conceited. Always, I, the greatest painter in Japan, was plastered across his forehead. His bad temperament manifested itself beyond his work, through a profound contempt for all customs and practices in life. According to an apprentice who had lived with him for a long time, one day a spirit was spouting a terrible oracle from the mouth of the famous medium of Higaki. Yoshide, turning a deaf ear to the oracle, took the brush and ink he always carried and painted the medium's frightening face. Our painter deemed the eventuality of being cursed by a spirit as serious as a child's play. Yoshide did inconceivably sacrilegious things. In picturing the goddess Kichiyoten, he copied the face of an abject courtesan, and in picturing the king of the magical signs Fudo, the god that destroys all demons, he copied a thief's figure, and so on. But if someone reprimanded him, he answered impudently, how strange! Do you really believe the deity Yoshida painted will hit him with lightning? When he spoke in this way, many of his own disciples took leave of him in fearful anticipation of terrible consequences. In other words, Yoshida was arrogance incarnate. He truly thought he was the smartest man under the sun. No need to say how highly he esteemed himself as a painter. His paintings were so different in brushwork and coloring from those of other painters that many of his colleagues, who were on bad terms with him, considered him an impostor. Several legends affirm that the famous paintings by the ancient masters like Kawanari, Kanoaka, and others were so well rendered that one could smell the fragrance of the plum blossoms painted on the doors as a delicate scent wafted about in the moonlit nights. And one could also hear the courtiers painted on a screen, play their flutes. But all the paintings by Yoshidi seemed to elicit disturbing feelings. One would cite the scenes of the Guyoyoshi, the cycle of births and death, hung on the portal of the Yuyagi temple. Each time one passed under the gate at night, one could hear the celestial creatures sigh and sob. Some said they could smell the stench of rotting corpses. As rumor had it, the waiting ladies whose likeness Yoshida had painted at the Lord's command all fell ill and died within a few years. According to the slanderers, those events were proofs of Yoshida's dabbling in black arts. His paintings, the critics said, were cursed. Being an eccentric, Yoshida took pride in these rumors. Once, when the Lord told him as a joke, it would seem you are partial to ugliness, he replied with arrogance, a grin on that strangely red mouth of his. That is true, my lord. It is an unaccomplished artist who cannot perceive 
beauty, and ugliness. Notwithstanding his superiority over any other painter in the country, how could he make such a haughty reply to the Lord? His apprentice's secretly nicknamed Shida Iju, maybe you already know that Shida Iju was the name of Tengu, who came from China in older times. Nevertheless, even the insufferable shameless Yoshide was not without feelings. One single human emotion remained within him. Yoshide adored his only daughter, the little lady-in-waiting, and his love for her bordered on madness. As I said before, she was sweet and devoted to her father. It seems strange that to this avaricious man nothing was beautiful enough for his daughter. Kimono, hairpins, and expensive hairdressers. Although he never contributed his tithes or mites to any Buddhist temple, he doted so much on her no expense was too extravagant for the girl's adornment, although I do not know if this rumor is true. He adored her wildly and madly, and he never gave any thought to finding her a good husband. On the contrary, if anyone had courted her, he would have hired street assassins to get rid of the suitor in the dead of night. When the Lord expressed the wish of having the painter's daughter as a lady-in-waiting, Yoshida was so displeased, he came to the palace with a sour face, even in the presence of the Lord himself. The rumor that the Lord had called the painter's daughter to the palace because he was enamored of her beauty might have originated in the displeasure the painter bore so openly. I'm sure it was mere gossiping. While it was true that Yoshida adored his daughter and strongly wished to have her at home with him. One day, Yoshida painted a cherub in the likeness of one of the Lord's favorite boys. The Lord, please, said to the painter, Yoshide, I will grant any request of yours, so tell me what you wish. If it pleases your Lordship, Yoshide dared say, let my daughter be released from your service. The plaintiff's reply would have been conceivable if he had answered another Lord. But who would have imagined Yoshide would be so presumptuous as to ask of the Lord Horikawa to let go of his favorite lady-in-waiting, even though Yoshida loved his daughter so much. Even though the Lord was very indulgent, he seemed offended. He stared at the painter for a moment, and then he uttered, No, I can't grant that, and left on the spot. The two of them found themselves in the same situation four or five times. Thinking back on it, I can recall that the Lord's gaze became ever colder when he looked at the painter. And the painter's daughter wept when she was alone in her room, covering her face with the sleeve of her kimono. Thereafter, the rumor spread all the more that the Lord was enamored of the girl. Some say that the idea of having the scene from hell painted on the screen originated in the girl's refusal to comply with the Lord's wishes. No, it was only gossip, I am sure of it. In our opinion, the Lord did not dismiss the girl because he took pity on her and preferred to let her live in ease and comfort rather than send her back to that misanthropic father of hers. It was certain that the Lord felt affection for such a sweet-tempered girl, but to think his lordship had amorous motives was a far-fetched distortion of truth. No, I dare say it was a perfectly unfounded lie. Because of the painter's insistence on having his daughter back, his lordship had come to look upon Yoshida with considerable disfavor. Despite the lord's feelings about the painter, one day he summoned him to the palace and commanded him to paint a scene from hell on a screen. As I evoke the screen, I have the impression of seeing that terrifying scene before my eyes. The scene painted by Yoshida was quite different from those of other artists. First of all, because of its composition. The ten kings of hell and their households were confined to a corner, while all the rest consisted of wild flames roiling around the mountain of swords and the forest of spears, which seemed ready to take fire as well. Save for the blue and yellow of the Chinese-styled costumes worn by the governors of hell, which stood out here and there 
Everything else was ablaze, tongues of fires occupying all the space, hooked wheels dancing in fury, black smoke drawn with splattered ink and sparks shooting up, done in gold smeared and mingled with soot. These scenes would have sufficed to scare the human eye, but one could also see other personages writhing in agony among the flames. None of these characters ever appeared in the representations of hell painted by other artists. Yoshida had depicted every social class, from the noble and the dignitary to the beggar and the outcast, mandarins in formal costume, charming young ladies in waiting in elaborate five-pleat dresses, bonzes with rosaries hanging from their necks, vagrant clerics wearing high wedge clogs, very young handmaids in long clinging kimonos, Fortune tellers in the robes of Shinto priests holding a holy stick. I would never have the time to describe each of them. These people, tormented by the Gozumezu, fled in all directions among fire and smoke, like so many leaves scattered by the tempest. The woman who curled up like a spider, her hair caught in a fork, had probably been a shrine medium or priestess. The man with a halberd sticking out of his heart, upside down like a vampire bat, must have been a young province governor or something like that. And the uncountable others, flogged with iron whips, crushed under a rock a thousand men could barely move, pecked by weird birds or slashed open by the maws of a poisonous dragon. The punishments were as numerous as the sinners. One of these horrors, however, stood out in its own horrifying right surpassing all the rest. A carriage pulled by oxen descended from above, grazing the tops of the sword trees, which had branches like animal fangs spitting bodies of dead souls. In the carriage, with its bamboo blinds blown upward by the blast of hell, a court lady was visible, as splendidly dressed as an empress or an imperial concubine. Long black hair streaming and a white net bent backwards. Among the flames the lady writhed in agony. This rendering of a court lady writhing in a flame-wreathed carriage conveyed all the terror of hell. The frightening intensity of the scene was concentrated on this single personage. It was such an excellent masterpiece the spectator had the impression of hearing desperate screams. To paint that horrible scene, something terrible must have befallen the artist. Otherwise, how could even a painter as great as Yoshide depict the horror of hell in such a vivid manner? He must have traded his life to be able to paint that screen. Indeed, the hell Yoshide painted was the very hell to which he had condemned himself. I am afraid that in my hurry to describe this strange screen, I have lost the thread of my story. So I will return to the moment when Yoshide received the order to paint the picture of hell by the Lord. For five or six months, Yoshida absorbed himself in the painting of the screen, without making the briefest courtesy call at the palace. It was strange that despite his love for his daughter, not once had he the thought of seeing her. According to an apprentice, each time he started painting, he became like a man possessed by a fox. In fact, the rumor had it that Yoshide had gained fame and reputation because he had sworn himself to the vulpine god of good fortune. For proof, some said, snatch a peek at him while he is painting, and you will see the spirits of foxes thronging around him. Once he had picked up his brush, he forgot everything but his work. He confined himself to his study and never came out to see the sun. Now that he was painting the screen, his level of inspiration soared. Shut up in his study, with the blinds always drawn, he would mix his secret melanges of colors and had his apprentices dress up in gala costumes or in poor clothes before painting them with great care in the lamp's light. These oddities were usual with him. It would not have taken that special house scene to drive him to such extreme eccentricities. For instance, when he painted that scene from the Guyo Shohoji, the five phases of the transmigration of souls. He once came across rotting corpses in the street. He sat down in front of them and copied faces and hands, 
down to the single hairs, while normal people averted their eyes. Concerning the state of inspiration in which he painted that scene from hell, no one was ever able to imagine it. I do not have the time to give you all the particulars, and I will tell you only the notable moments. While one of his disciples was mixing colors, Yoshida said abruptly, I wish to rest for a while. I've had some bad dreams lately. You have, Master, the apprentice said, without interrupting his work for Yoshida's wish for rest was nothing unusual. But then the master asked in humble tones, Could you sit at my bedside while I'm resting? Even though the apprentice did not understand why the master was so worried about his dreams, the request was reasonable and he said, Very well, sir. To which the master, sounding troubled, added with some hesitation, Come into my inner room. Don't let anyone come inside while I'm sleeping. The apprentice remarked that the room in which his master was working, for the inner room meant his study, had the shutters drawn as if it were night, and the screen, with a scene sketched in charcoal, stood open in the dim light, taking up all the space. The artist went to sleep with his arm under his head, as if a great fatigue had descended on him. But after half an hour, terrifying noise came to the apprentice's ear. At first, it was a voice that spoke in an incomprehensible way, but little by little the words broke up to resemble the moans of a drowning man trying to speak underwater. How? Come to me. Where am I supposed to go? What are you saying? Where to? To hell? Come to the burning hell? Whoever is this? Who could it be? Ah! The apprentice forgot all about mixing colors to observe the fear in his master's face. He saw him gasping for breath, mouth open and sparse teeth visible. He noticed the dry lips, the sweating face, pale and wrinkled. Something was moving inside the mouth, as if pulled by a string. It was the master's tongue. Words came out, disconnected. I thought, it's really you? I thought you'd come. What? You come to take me away? Yes. Come. Come to hell. There your daughter is waiting for you. The scared apprentice glimpsed a dark figure looming from above and brushing against the open screen. He took Yoshide with all his strength, but the master continued speaking in his dream, refusing to awake. The apprentice found the courage to take the water set aside to wash the brushes, and he splashed it all into the master's face. I am waiting for you, Yoshida was saying, so hurry and get into the cart. Come along to hell. But the moment the water hit him, his words turned to a strangled moan. At last he opened his eyes, and he sprang up more wildly than if he had been jabbed with a needle. But the misshapen creatures must have been with him still, for he stared into space with mouth agape and with terrified eyes. At length he returned to himself, and without a hint of gratitude, barked at the poor apprentice. I'm all right now. Get out of here. The apprentice knew he would be scolded if he resisted his master at a time like this, so he hurried out of the room. But he told me that when he saw the sunlight again, he felt as relieved as if he were waking from his own nightmare. This was by no means Yoshida at his worst, however. A month later, he called yet another apprentice into the inner room. The young man found Yoshida standing in the gloom of the oil lamps, biting the end of his paintbrush. Without a moment's hesitation, Yoshida turned to him and said, Sorry, but I need you naked again. The master had ordered such things in the past, so the apprentice quickly stripped off his clothes. But now Yoshida said with a strange scowl, I want to see a person in chains, so do what I tell you. Sorry about this, but it will just take a little while. Yoshida could mouth apologetic phrases, but he issued his cold commands without the least show of sympathy. This particular apprentice was a well-built lad who looked more suited to wielding a sword than a paintbrush. 
but even he must have been shocked by what happened. I figured the master had gone crazy and was going to kill me, he told people again and again long afterward. Yoshida was apparently annoyed by the young man's slow preparations. Instead of waiting, he dragged out a narrow iron chain from heaven knows where and all but pounced on the apprentice's back, wrenching the man's arms behind him and winding him in the chain. Then he gave the end of the chain a cruel yank and sent the young man crashing down on the floor. The apprentice lay there like, what? Like a keg of sake that someone had knocked over, legs and arms mercilessly contorted. He could move only his head, and with a chain cutting off the circulation of his blood, you know, his skin swelled red, face, torso, everywhere. Yoshida, though, was apparently not the least bit concerned. To see him like this, he circled this sake keg of a body, observing it from every angle and drawing a sketch after sketch. I am certain, without my spelling it out, you can imagine what torture this must have been for the poor apprentice. If nothing had interrupted it, the young man's ordeal would almost surely have lasted even longer. But fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, a narrow winding streak like black oil began to flow from behind a large jar in the corner of the room. At first it moved slowly like a thick liquid, but then it began to slide along the floor, more smoothly glinting in the darkness, until it was almost touching the apprentice's nose. He took a good look at it, gasped and screamed, A snake! A snake! The way he described the moment to me, he felt as if every drop of blood in his body would freeze, which I can well understand. For in fact, the snake's cold tongue was just about to touch the flesh of his neck, where the chain was biting. Even Yoshida, for all his perversity, must have felt a rush of horror at this unforeseeable occurrence. Flinging his brush down, he bent and gripped the snake by the tail, dangling it upside down. The snake raised its head and began to coil upward around its own body, but it could not reach Yoshida's hand. You cost me a good brush stroke, damn you, he growled at the snake, flinging it into the jar in the corner. Then with obvious reluctance, he loosened the chains that bound the apprentice's body. In fact, loosening the chains was as far as he was willing to go. For the youth himself, he spared not a word of sympathy. I suspect he was more enraged at having botched a single brush stroke than concerned that his apprentice might have been bitten by a snake. I often heard afterwards that he had been keeping the snake to sketch from. I imagine that what little you have heard is enough for you to grasp the fanatic intensity with which Yoshida approached his work. But let me give you one last terrible example concerning a young apprentice, no more than 13 or 14, who could have lost his life for the hell screen. It happened one night when the boy, whose skin was fair as a girl's, was called into the master's studio. There he found Yoshida by the tripod lamp, balancing a piece of raw meat on his palm and feeding it to a bird the likes of which he had never seen before. The bird was the size of a cat, and in fact, with its two feather tufts sticking out from its head like ears and its big, round, amber-colored eyes, it did, did look very much like a cat. Yoshide was a man who simply hated to have anyone pry into his business, and the snake I told you about was one such case. He would never let his apprentice know what kinds of things he had in his studio. Depending on the subject he happened to be painting at the time, he might have a human skull perched on his table, or rows of silver bowls and gold lacquered stands. You never knew, and his helpers told me they had no idea where he kept such things when he was not using them. This was surely one reason for the rumor that Yoshida was the beneficiary of miraculous aid from a god of fortune. Well then, the young apprentice, assuming for himself that the strange bird on the table was a model Yoshida needed for the health screen, knelt before the painter and asked in all humility, How can I help you, master? Almost as if he had not heard the boy speak, Yoshida licked his red lips and jerked his chin toward the bird. Not bad, eh? Look how tame it is. 
Please tell me, master, what is it? I have never seen anything like it before, the boy said, keeping his wary gaze fixed on the cat-like bird with ears. What? Never seen anything like it? Yoshida responded with his familiar, scornful laugh. That's what you get for growing up in the capital. It's a bird, a horned owl. A hunter brought it to me a few days ago from Mount Kurama. Only you don't usually find them so tame. As he spoke, Yoshida slowly raised his hand and gave a soft upward stroke to the feathers of the owl's back just as the bird finished swallowing the chunk of meat. Instantly, the bird emitted a shriek and leaped from the tabletop, aiming his outstretched talons at the apprentice's face. Had the boy not shot his arm out to protect himself, I have no doubt that he would have ended up with more than a gash or two on his face. He cried out and shook his sleeve in an attempt to sweep the ward away, with only added to the fury of the attack. Beak clattering, the owl lunged at him again. Disregarding Yoshida's presence, the apprentice ran wildly around the cramped room, now standing to defend himself, now crouching to drive the bird away. The monster, of course, struck with him, flying up when he stood up and down when he crouched down, and using any opening to go straight for his eyes. With each lunge came a tremendous flapping of wings that filled the boy with dread. He felt so lost, he said later, that the familiar studio felt like a haunted valley deep in the mountains with the smell of rotting leaves the spray of a waterfall the sour fumes of a fruit stashed away by a monkey even the dim glow of the master's oil lamp on its tripod looked to him like misty moonlight in the hills being attacked by the owl however was not what most frightened the lad what really made his flesh crawl was the way the master yoshide followed the commotion with his cold stare taking his time to spread out a piece of paper, lick his brush, and then set about capturing the terrible image of a delicate boy being tormented by a hideous bird. At the sight, the apprentice was overcome by an inexpressible terror. For a time, he says, he even thought his master might kill him. And you actually couldn't say that such a thing was out of the question, for it did seem that Yoshida's sole purpose and calling the apprentice to his studio that night had been to set the owl on him and draw him trying to escape. Thus, when the apprentice caught that glimpse of his master at work, he felt his arms come up to protect his head and heard an incoherent scream escape his throat as he slumped down against the sliding door in the corner of the room. In that same instant, Yoshida himself cried out and jumped to his feet, whereupon the beating of the owl's wings grew faster and louder, and there came the clatter of something falling over, and a tearing sound. Having covered his head in terror, the apprentice now raised it again to find that the room had gone pitch dark, and he heard Yoshida's angry voice calling to the other apprentices. Eventually there was a far-off cry in response, and soon an apprentice rushed in with a lantern held high. In his sooty smelling glow, the boy saw the tripod collapsed on the floor and the mats and planking soaked in the oil of the overturned lamp. He saw the owl, too, beating one wing in apparent pain as it flopped around the room. On the far side of the table, looking stunned, Yoshida was raising himself from the floor and muttering something incomprehensible. And no wonder. That black snake was tightly coiled around the owl from neck to tail and over one wing. The apprentice had probably knocked the jar over as he slumped to the floor, and when the snake crawled out, the owl must have made the mistake of trying to grab it in its talons, only to give rise to the struggle. The two apprentices gaped at the bizarre scene and at each other, until with a silent bow to the master, they slipped out of the room. What happened to the owl and snake after that, no one knows. This was by no means the only such incident. I forgot to mention that it was the beginning of autumn when his lordship commanded Yoshida to paint the hell screen. From then until the end of winter, the apprentices were continually subjected to their master's frightening behavior. At that point, however, something seemed to interfere with Yoshida's work on the screen. An even deeper layer of gloom came to settle over him, and he spoke to his assistants in markedly harsher tones. 
The screen was perhaps a tense finished, but it showed no further signs of progress. Indeed, Yoshide occasionally seemed to be on the verge of painting over those parts that he had already completed. No one knew what he was finding so difficult about the screen, and what's more, no one tried to find out. Stung by those earlier incidents, his apprentices felt as if they were locked in a cage with a tiger or a wolf, and they found ways to keep their distance from the master. For that reason, I have little to tell you about that period. The only unusual thing I can think of is that the hard-headed old codger suddenly turned weepy. People would often see him shedding tears when he was alone. An apprentice told me that one day he walked into the gardens and saw a master standing on the veranda, gazing blankly at the sky with its promise of spring, his eyes full of tears. Embarrassed for the old man, the apprentice says, he silently withdrew. Don't you find it odd that this arrogant man, who went so far as to sketch a corpse on the roadside for his five levels of rebirth, would cry like an infant just because the painting on the screen wasn't going as well as he wanted it to? In any case, while Yoshida was madly absorbed in his work on the screen, his daughter began to show increasing signs of melancholy, until the rest of us could see that she was often fighting back her tears. A pale, reserved, sad-faced girl to begin with. She took on a genuinely mournful aspect as her lashes grew heavy and shadows began to form around her eyes. This gave rise to all sorts of speculation. That she was worried about her father, or that she was suffering the pangs of love. But soon people were saying that it was all because his lordship was trying to bend her to his will. Then the gossiping began ground to a halt, as though everyone had suddenly forgotten about her. A certain event occurred at that time. Well, after the first watch of the night, I was walking down an outdoor corridor when the monkey Yoshide came flying at me from out of nowhere and started tugging at my trouser skirts. As I recall it, this was one of those warm early spring nights when you expect at any time now to be catching the romantic fragrance of plum blossoms in the pale moonlight. But what did I see in the moon's faint glow? It was a monkey bearing its white fangs, wrinkling up its nose and shrieking with almost manic intensity. An eerie chill was only three parts of what I felt. The other seven parts were anger at having my new trousers yanked at like that, and I considered kicking the beast aside and continuing on my way. I quickly changed my mind, however, recalling the case of the samurai who had earned the young master's displeasure by tormenting the monkey. And besides, the way the monkey was behaving, there was obviously something wrong. I therefore gave up trying to resist and allowed myself to be pulled several paces further. Where the corridor turned a corner, the pale surface of his lordship's pond could be seen stretching off through the darkness beyond a great, gentle drooping pine. When the animal led me to that point, my ears were salted by the frantic, yet strangely muffled sounds of what I took to be a struggle in a nearby room. All else was hushed. I heard no voices, no sounds but the splash of a fish leaping in the mingled moonlight and fog. The sound of the struggle brought me up short. If this was an intruder, I resolved I would teach him a lesson, and holding my breath, I edged closer to the sliding door. My approach hour was obviously too slow and cautious for the monkey. Yoshida scampered around me in circles, once, twice, three times, then bounded up to my shoulder with a strangled cry instinctively. I jerked my head aside to avoid being scratched. The monkey dug its claws into my sleeve to keep from slipping down. This sent me staggering, and I stumbled backwards, slamming against the door. Now I could no longer hesitate. I shot the door open and crouched to spring in beyond the moonlight's edge. At that very moment, something rose up to block my view. With a start, I realized it was a woman. She fled towards me as if someone had flung her out of the room. She nearly hit me, but instead she tumbled forward, and why, I could not tell. Went down on one knee before me, trembling and breathless, and staring up at me, as if at some terrifying sight. I'm sure I need not tell you it was Yoshida's daughter. 
That night, however, my eyes beheld her with a new vividness, as though she were an utterly different person. Her eyes were huge and shining, and her cheeks seemed to be burning red. Her disheveled clothes gave her an erotic allure that contrasted sharply with her usual childish innocence. Could this actually be the daughter of Yoshide? I wondered. That frail-looking girl, so modest and self-effacing in all things. Leaning against the sliding wooden door, I stared at this beautiful girl in the moonlight, and then, as if they were capable of pointing, I flicked my eyes toward the hurried footsteps, receding into the distance to ask her soundlessly, Who was that? The girl bit her lip and shook her head in silence. I could see she felt deeply mortified. I bent over her and speaking softly next to her ear, now put my question into words. Who was that? But again she refused to answer, and would only shake her head. Indeed, she bit her lip harder than ever as tears gathered on her long lashes. Born stupid, I can never understand anything that is imperfectly obvious, and so I had no idea what to say to her. I could do nothing but stand there feeling as if my only purpose was to listen to the wild beating of her heart. Of course, one thing that kept me silent was the conviction that it would be wrong of me to question her any further. How long this went on, I do not know. But eventually, I slid shut the door and gently told the girl, Go to your room now. Her agitation seemed to have subsided somewhat. Assailed by an uneasy feeling that I had seen something I was not meant to see, in a sense of shame toward anyone and no one in particular, I began to pad my way back up the corridor. I had hardly walked ten paces, however, when again I felt a tug, a timid one, at the skirt of my trousers. I whirled around startled, but what do you think it was? I looked down to find the monkey, Yoshida, prostrating himself at my feet, hands on the floor like a human being, bowing over and over in thanks, his golden bell ringing. Perhaps two weeks went by after that. All of a sudden, Yoshides arrived at the mansion to beg a personal audience with his lordship. He probably dared do, do such a thing despite his humble station because he had long been in his lordship's special favor. His lordship rarely allowed anyone to come into his presence. But that day, as so often before, he assented readily to Yoshida's request and had him shown in without a moment's delay. The man wore his usual reddish-brown robe and tall, black, soft hat. His face revealed a new level of sullenness, but he went down on all fours before his lordship, and at length, eyes down, he began to speak in husky tones. I come into your honored presence this day, my lord, regarding the screen bearing images of hell, which his lordship ordered me to paint. I have applied myself to it day and night, outdone myself such that my efforts have begun to bear fruit, and it is largely finished. This is excellent news. I am very pleased. Even as his lordship spoke these words, however, his voice seemed oddly lacking in power and vitality. No, my lord, I am afraid the news is anything but excellent, said Yoshide, his eyes still fastened on the floor in a way that hinted at anger. The work may be largely finished, but there is still a part that I am unable to paint. What? Unable to paint? Indeed, sir. As a rule, I can only paint what I have seen. Or even if I succeed in painting something unknown to me, I myself cannot be satisfied with it. This is the same as not being able to paint it. Does his lordship not agree? As his lordship listened to Yoshida's words, his face gradually took on a mocking smile. Which would mean that if you wanted to paint a screen depicting hell, you would have to have seen hell itself? Exactly, my lord. In the great fire some years ago, though, I saw flames with my own eyes that I could use for those of the hell of searing heat. In fact, I succeeded with my photo of twisting flames only because I experienced that fire. I believe my lord is familiar with the painting. What about sinners, though, 
and hell wardens. You have never seen those, have you? His lordship challenged Yoshide with one question after another as though he had not heard Yoshide's words. I have seen a person bound in an iron chain, said Yoshide, and I have done a detailed sketch of someone being tormented by a monstrous bird. No, I think it cannot be said that I have never seen sinners being tortured. And as for how warden, said Yoshide, breaking into an eerie smile, my eyes have beheld them any number of times as I drift between sleeping and waking. The bull-headed ones, the horse-headed ones, the three-faced, six-armed devils. Almost every night they come to torture me with their soundless clapping hands, their voiceless gaping mouths. No, they are not the ones I'm having so much difficulty painting. I suspect it shocked even his lordship. For a long while he only glared at Yoshida until, with an angry twitch of the brow, he spat out. All right, then. What is it that you say you are unable to paint? In the center of the screen, falling from the sky, I want to paint an aristocrat's carriage, its cabin woven of the finest split palm leaf. As he spoke, Yoshida raised himself to look directly at his lordship for the first time, and with a penetrating gaze. I had heard that Yoshida could be like a madman where Paney was concerned. To me, the look in his eyes at that moment was terrifying in that very way. In the carriage, a voluptuous noblewoman writhes in agony, her long black hair tossing in the ferocious flames. Her face, well, perhaps she contorts her brows and casts her gaze skyward towards the ceiling of the cabin as she chokes on the rising clouds of smoke. Her hands might tear at the cloth streamers of the carriage blinds as she struggles to ward off the shower of sparks raining down upon her. Around her swarm fierce carnivorous birds, perhaps a dozen or more, snapping their beaks in anticipation. Oh, my Lord, it is this, this image of the noblewoman in the carriage that I am unable to paint. And therefore, his Lordship seemed to be deriving an odd sort of pleasure from this as he urged Yoshida to continue. But Yoshida himself, red lips trembling as with a fever, could only repeat as if in a dream. This is what I am unable to paint. Then suddenly, all but biting into his own words, he cried, I beg you, my lord, have your men set a carriage on fire. Let me watch the flames devour its frame and its woven cabin. And if possible, a dark cloud crossed his lordship's face. But no sooner had it passed than he broke into a loud cackle. He was still choking with laughter when he spoke. Possible? I'll do whatever you want. Don't waste time worrying about what is possible. His lordship's words filled me with a terrible foreboding. And in fact, his appearance at that moment was anything but ordinary. White foam were gathered at the corners of his mouth. His eyebrows convulsed into jagged bolts of lightning. It was as if his lordship himself had become infused with Yoshida's madness. And no sooner had he finished speaking than laughter, endless laughter, exploded from his throat once again. I'll burn a carriage for you, he said, and I'll have a voluptuous woman inside it, dressed in a noble woman's robes. She will die writhing with agony of flames and black smoke. I have to salute you, Yoshide. Who could have thought of such a thing but the greatest painter in the land? Yoshida went pale when he heard this, and for a time the only part of him that moved was his lips. He seemed to be gasping for breath. Then, as though all the muscles of his body had gone limp at once, he crumpled forward with his hands on the matted floor again. A thousand thanks to you, my lord, Yoshida said with rare humility, his voice barely audible. Perhaps the full horror of his own plan had come all too clear to him as he spoke it spelled out his lordship's words. Only this one time in my life did I ever think of Yoshida as a man to be pitied. Two or three nights later, his lordship summoned Yoshida as promised to witness the burning of the carriage. He held the event not at the Horikawa mansion, but outside the capital, at his young sister's mountain retreat, widely known as the Palace of the Melting Snows. 
No one had lived at this palace for a very long time. Its spacious gardens had gone wild, and the desolate site must have given rise to all sorts of rumors, many about his lordship's sister, who had actually died there. People used to say that on moonless nights, her ladyship's broad-skirted scarlet trousers would glide eerily along the outdoor corridor, never touching the floor. And no wonder there were such stories. The palace was lonely enough in the daytime, but once the sun set, it became downright unnerving. The garden stream would murmur ominously in the darkness, and herons would swoop in the starlight like monstrous creatures. As it happened, the carriage burning took place on one of those pitch-dark moonless nights. Oil lamps revealed his lordship seated in cross-legged ease on the veranda. Beneath a turquoise robe he wore deep lavender-patterned trousers. On a thick round mat edged in white brocade, his position was of course elevated above the half-dozen or so attendants who surrounded him. One among them appeared most eager to be of service to his lordship, a burly samurai who had distinguished himself in the campaign against the northern barbarians some years earlier. He was said to have survived starvation by eating human flesh, after which he had the strength to tear out the antlers of a living stag with his bare hands. On this night he knelt in stern readiness below the veranda and scabbard at his armored waist a sword tipped up and hacked like a gull's tail, ready to be drawn at a moment's notice. These men presented a strangely terrifying, almost dreamlike spectacle. The lamp light flickering in the night wind turned them all dark one moment, bright the next. And then there was the carriage itself. Even without an ox attached to its long black shafts, their ends resting on the usual low bench that tilted the whole thing slightly forward, it stood out against the night, its tall cabin woven of the finest split palm leaf, exactly as Yoshida had requested, truly a conveyance worthy of his imperial majesty, or the most powerful minister of state. When I saw its gold fittings gleaming like stars in the sky, and considered what was soon to happen to this lavishly appointed vehicle. A shiver went through me in spite of the warm spring night. As for what might be inside the carriage, there was no way to tell. Its lovely blinds, woven of still green bamboo, and edged in patterned cloth, had been rolled down tight, and around its alert-looking conscripts stood guard, holding flaming torches and showing their concern that too much smoke might be drifting towards his lordship on the veranda. Yoshida himself was situated at some remove, kneeling on the ground directly opposite the veranda. He wore what seemed to be his usually reddish-brown robe and tall black soft hat, and he looked especially small and shabby, as though the star-filled sky were a weight pressing down upon him. Behind him knelt another person in an outfit like his, probably an apprentice he had brought along, with them crouching down low in the darkness like that. I could not make out the color of their robes from my place below the veranda. Midnight was approaching. I believe. I felt as if the darkness enveloping the garden were silently watching us all breathing, the only sound an occasional rush of night wind, each gust wafting towards us the resinous smell from the pine smoke of the torches. His lordship remained silent for some moments, observing the mysterious scene, but then, edging forward where he sat. He cried sharply, Yoshide! Yoshide may have said some word in response, but to my ears it sounded like nothing so much as a moan. Tonight, Yoshide, I'm going to burn a carriage for you, as you requested. When he said this, his lordship glanced at the men around him. I thought I saw a meaningful smile pass between him and certain of them. Of course, it could have been my imagination. Now Yoshida seemed to be timidly raising his head and looking up towards the veranda, but still he waited, saying nothing. I want you to look at this, his lordship said. This is my carriage, the one I use every day. You know it well, I'm sure. I will not have it set for fire in order that you may see the hell of searing heat here on earth before your eyes. His lordship reverted to silence, and his eyes flashed, another signal to his men. Then with sudden vehemence he cried, 
Chained inside the carriage is a sinful woman. When we set the carriage afire, her flesh will be roasted. Her bones will be charred. She will die an agonizing death. Never again will you have such a perfect model for the screen. Do not fail to watch as her snow-white flesh erupts in flame. See and remember her long black hair dancing in a whirl of sparks. His lordship sank into silence for yet a third time, but whatever could have been in his mind, now all he did was laugh soundlessly, his shoulders quaking. Never again will there be a sight like this, Yoshide. I shall join you in observing it. All right, men, raise the blind. Let Yoshida see the woman inside. On hearing his command, one of the conscripts, torch held high, strode up to the carriage, stretched out his free hand, and whipped the blind up. The torch crackled and flickered and cast its red gleam inside. On the carriage's matted floor, cruelly chained, sat a woman. And, oh, who could have failed to recognize her? Her long black hair flowed in a voluptuous band across a gorgeous robe, embroidered in cherry blossoms, and the golden hairpins on top of her downcast head sparkled beautifully in the firelight. For all the differences in costuming, there was no mistaking that girlish frame, that graceful neck, where now a gag was fastened, that touchingly modest profile. They belonged to none other than Yoshida's daughter. I could hardly keep from crying out. Just then the samurai kneeling across from me sprang to his feet, and pressing threateningly on his sword hilt, glared at Yoshide. Startled by the sudden movement, I turned my gaze towards Yoshide. He looked as if the spectacle were driving him half mad. Where he had been crouching until then, he was on his feet now and poised, arms outstretched, to run towards the carriage. Unfortunately, though, as I said before, he was in the shadows far away from me, and so I did not have a clear view of his face. My frustration lasted but a moment, however. Now drained of color, though, it was Yoshida's face. Or should I say, Yoshida's entire form, raised aloft by some invisible power, appeared before me with such clarity it seemed to have cut its way through the surrounding darkness. For suddenly his lordship had cried, Burn it! The conscripts flung their torches in the carriage with Yoshida's daughter inside burst into flame. The fire engulfed the entire carriage. The purple roof tassels blew aside, then clouds of smoke swirled aloft, stark white against the blackness of the night, and finally a shower of sparks spurted upward with such terrifying force that in a single instant the blinds, the side panels, and the roof's metal fittings were ripped off in the blast and sent flying. Still more horrible was the color of the flames that licked the latticed cabin vents before shooting skyward as though might I say, the sun itself had crashed to earth, spewing its heavenly fire in all directions. As close as I had come to crying out before, now I could only gape in mute awe at the horrifying spectacle. But what of the girl's father? I will never forget the look on Yoshida's face at that moment. He had started towards the carriage on impulse, but halted when the flames flared up. He then stood there with arms outstretched, eyes devouring the smoke and flames that enveloped the carriage. In the firelight that bathed him from head to toe, I could see every feature of his ugly, wrinkled face, his wide staring eyes, his contorted lips, the twitching flesh of his cheeks, all drew a vivid picture of the shock, the terror, and the sorrow that traversed Yoshida's heart by turns. Such anguish, I suspect, would not be seen even on the face of a convicted thief about to have his head cut off, or the guiltiest sinner about to face the judgment of the ten kings of hell. Even the powerful samurai went pale at the sight and stole a fearful glance at his lordship above him. But what of his lordship himself? Biting his lip and smiling strangely now and then, he stared straight ahead, never taking his eyes off the carriage. And the girl in the carriage... Ah, uh, I don't think I have the courage to describe in detail what she looked like then. The pale whiteness of her upturned face as she choked on the smoke. The tangled length of her hair as she tried to shake the flames from it. The beauty of her cherry blossom robes as it burst into flame. It was all so cruel, so terrible. Especially at one point when the night wind rushed down from the mountain to sweep away the smoke. 
the sight of her against a flaming background of red flecked with gold dust, gnawing at her gag, writhing as if to snap the chains that bound her. It was enough to make our flesh creep. Not only mine, but the powerful samurais as well, as if the tortures of hell were being pictured right before our eyes. Just then the night wind gusted once more, rustling the branches of the garden's trees, or so it seemed to me, and I am sure to everyone else. Such a sound seemed to race through the dark sky, and in that instant some black thing shot from the palace roof into the blazing carriage. It traveled in a perfectly straight line like a ball that had been kicked, neither touching the earth nor arcing through space, and as the carriage's burning side lattice collapsed inward, Glowing as if coated in crimson lacquer, the thing grasped the girl's straining shoulders and hurled a long, piercing and inexpressibly anguished scream out beyond the billowing smoke. Another scream followed, and then a third, until we all found ourselves crying out with it. For though it had been left tethered back at the Horikawa mansion, what we saw not clinging to the girl's shoulder against a flaming backdrop was the monkey Yoshide. We could see the monkey for only the briefest moment, though, a fountain of sparks shot up to the sky like gold dust and black lacquer. And then not only the monkey but the girl too was shrouded in black smoke. Now in the middle of the garden there was only a carriage of fire seething in flames with a terrible roar. No, pillar of fire might better describe this horrific conflagration boiling up to the starry heavens. But oh, how strange it was to see the painter now standing absolutely rigid before the pillar of fire. Yoshide, who only a few moments earlier had seemed to be suffering the torments of hell, stood there with his arms locked across his chest, as if he had forgotten even the presence of his lordship. His whole wrinkled face suffused now with an inexpressible radiance, the radiance of religious ecstasy. I could have sworn that the man's eyes were no longer watching his daughter dying in agony, that instead the gorgeous colors of flames and the sight of a woman suffering in them were giving him joy beyond measure. The most wondrous thing was not that he watched his only daughter's death throes with apparent joy, but rather that Yoshida at that moment possessed a strange inhuman majesty that resembled the rage of the king of beasts himself, as you might see him in a dream. For this reason, although I might have been imagining it, the countless night birds that flew around squawking in alarm at each new eruption of flames seemed to keep their distance from Yoshida's tall black hat. Perhaps even these instant sentient birds could see the mysterious grandeur that hung above Yoshida like a radiant aura. If the birds could see it, how much more so the rest of us, down to the lowly conscripts. Trembling inwardly, scarcely breathing, and filled with a bizarre sense of adoration, we kept our eyes fastened on Yoshida, as if we were present at the decisive moment when a lump of stone or wood becomes a holy image of the Buddha. The carriage flames that filled the heavens with a roar. Yoshida, under the spell of the flames, transfixed. What sublimity, what rapture, but among us only one. His lordship looked on as if transformed into another person. His noble countenance drained of color, the corners of his mouth flecked with foam, hands clutching his knees through his lavender trousers as he panted like a beast in need of water. Word soon spread that his lordship had burned that carriage that night in the palace of the melting snows, and there seemed to have been many who were highly critical of the event. First of all came the question of Yoshida's daughter. Why had his lordship chosen to burn her alive? The rumor most often heard was that he had done it out of spite for her rejection of his love. I am certain, however, that he did it to punish the twisted personality of an artist. He would go so far as to burn a carriage and kill a human being to complete the painting of a screen. In fact, I overheard his lordship saying as much himself. And then there was Yoshide, whose stony heart was also apparently the topic of much negative commentary. How, after seeing his own daughter burned alive, could he want to finish the screen painting? Some cursed him as a beast in human guise, who had forgotten a father's love for the sake of a picture. One who allied himself with this opinion was his reverend, the abbot of Yokawa, who always used to say, excel in his art, though he might, 
If a man does not know the five virtues, he can only end up in hell. A month went by, and the screen with its images of hell was finished at last. Yoshida brought it to the mansion that very day and humbly presented it for his lordship's inspection. His reverence happened to be visiting at the time, and I am certain that he was shocked at the sight of the horrible firestorm blasting through it. Until he actually saw the screen, he was glowering at Yoshide, but then he slapped his knee and exclaimed, What magnificent work! I can still see the bitter smile on his lordship's face when he heard those words. Almost no one spoke ill of Yoshide after that, at least not in the mansion. Could it be because all who saw the screen, even those who had always hated him, were struck by strangely solemn feelings when they witnessed the torture of the hell of searing heat in all their reality? By then, however, Yoshide, numbered among those who are no longer of this world, the night after he finished his screen, he tied a rope to a beam in his room and hanged himself. I suspect that having sent his daughter on ahead to the other world, he could not bear to go on living here as if nothing had happened. His body lies buried in the ruins of his home. The little stone marker is probably so cloaked in moss now, after decades of exposure to the wind and rain, that no one can tell whose grave it is anymore.